Hi everyone and thank you for joining us for this 2021 Sundance Film Festival panel, Normalizing Access, Exposure and Opportunity, presented by Macro and Shadow and Act. My name is Trey Mangum and I'm the Deputy Editor of Shadow and Act and on behalf of Macro and Shadow and Act, I welcome you to our panel. We wish that we were in Park City this year, but we are still bringing you informative chats and programming that will be held virtually. We have a super, super fantastic panel coming up with some great folks. I'm excited to introduce them, but first, I want to give everyone a primer on both Macro and Shot on Act. As a multi-platform media company, Macro is committed to representing the voices and perspectives of persons of color to present a new paradigm in the media landscape and disrupt the way things have always been done, which is evident in their upcoming film, Judas and the Black Messiah. And Shadow and Act is the premier digital destination for all things film, television, and Broadway as it relates to Black entertainment across the diaspora and Africa. So, Macro and Shadow and Act are bringing this conversation with some of the top disruptors in the industry, and we're going to unveil methods and the importance of scaling impact and passing on the access, exposure, and opportunity needed to fill this new world with our stories, experiences, and perspectives. So I'm so happy to welcome three dynamic panelists today. We have Franklin Leonard, who is the founder of The Blacklist. We have Tulane Jones, the president of Array, and we have Christine Simmons, the COO and lead of the Office of Representation, Inclusion, Equity of the Academy. And thank you all three for being here today. Thanks, Thanks for having us. Yes, yes. So, so ready to just dive right in um, to this important conversation. I'd like to start off with something that, you know, a lot of people talk about when it comes to programs that a lot of networks and studios put on to, you know, diversify their talent pipeline. What do you think is one misconception about programs like these? And what's one thing that you think that people should know more about these types of programs and initiatives? To Lane, <laughs> um, Well, look, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of hazard a, a guess here. I think you know, look, I, I find myself generally frustrated by the way that a lot of these programs are structured, if I'm being very honest, because I think that there's an assumption that diverse talent or, or talent that has historically been excluded from the marketplace needs additional training, additional seasoning in order to be ready for prime time, right? That, that somehow the writers who come from backgrounds, from communities that have historically been underrepresented need more work so that they can be achieving at the level of their peers who are part of sort of the dominant paradigm. And I just, it's not true, right? Just I'll put a very fine point on it. That is flawed thinking. Our communities have never needed more seasoning. If anything, it's other communities that need our seasoning in order so that they can have a good meal. And the fact of the matter is, is that most of these writers, most of these filmmakers who are going through these programs could just as easily be hired in the jobs that these programs are designed to train people for and be just as successful, if not more than the folks who are getting hired because they went to school with someone's father, they happen to know somebody because they play golf with them or they, they share the same poker table once a week. Um, and so, you know, the blacklist gets involved from time to time with studios uh, in order to find writers for opportunities at those studios. And we have a very clear rule about that, which is these are not opportunities to be part of a training program. These are opportunities to be hired. You do not get hired to be trained. You get hired for a two-step guild minimum blind deal at a minimum. And then once you have that contract, once you have that deal, you are no different than any other person that the studio has given money in exchange for writing services. Um, and, and so that's, that's sort of my thinking on these programs. I'm sure there are exceptions, but at the end of the day, members of our community don't need additional training in order to be successful. We need the same opportunity that everyone else has had for the entire history of Hollywood. I agree with Franklin. I think, um, you know, through Array Alliance, our nonprofit, um, a lot of the programming, a lot of the uh, new initiatives that we have coming up are really for 
um, you know, crew members that already have the experience. It's really more about making sure that they have the opportunity than it is for um, additional training. Um, because we feel like if you have a credit, if you have several credits, um, then you have the training that you need. And really what you need is the opportunity to be able to have and do the job. Yeah, it's just, it's a it's really about visibility, right? And making sure that they are getting the visibility, the connections, the opportunities that everybody else has. And um, that way we can assist and partner with those that provide those opportunities to make them more visible. I think that's really the shift that we've seen. Um, I would agree that in the past, there's been a lot of other programs that um, have try to supplement skill sets, if you will. And of course, earlier in, in people's careers, you know, we, we have a lot of pipeline programs and that's fantastic, but really it's about that social capital where you can open opportunities and create those connections that Frank, Franklin alluded to that, you know, maybe we just didn't have because we weren't in those little circles and in those clicks per se. And so how then we do we do that? And then at the same time, how are we looking at uh, the, the structure and and the opportunity and all of those things. How do we disrupt that so that way more people have those opportunities and, and hold that site just as accountable as well? Yeah, yeah. And a lot of times it's about, you know, we always say just to get your foot in the door. And access and exposure are often linked to opportunities, you know, in career and education, but accessibility often starts earlier than that. And what are some ways that you think that we can actively enact this accessibility in the lives of young and marginalized creatives? For me, at least, I think that the first step in sort of give it, breaking in the door is to, to do the thing that you're trying to do, right? So if you're trying to be a writer, you need to write a script. I don't know how many times I've met people who are like, I'm trying to be a writer, like, what can you do to put me on? And I'm like, okay, well, well, how many scripts have you written? Like, what, what, what's your best piece of work? And they're like, well, you know, I'm almost done. I'm like, that's, that's not an answer, right? You, you should have a piece of work that you are proud of that you feel confident that you can hand to anybody and be like, listen, if you don't like this, fair play, the, the world is subjective, but you and I probably don't see the world in the same way because anybody who sees the world like me is probably going to like this because I know I put my heart and soul into this and it's good. I have refined it to the point that people are telling me who have no vested in, who have no vested interest in my success that this is strong and if I could invest in it, I would. Um, I think the same thing is true with directing really any trade try to do the work itself and that may mean making a short on your phone if you have a phone and you have the internet if you're watching this you probably have the tools necessary to make something right and in making something especially because film and television and really any sort of scripted visual work is a collaborative medium you are going to be interacting with other people that are doing the same thing those people will probably have communities that are connected to other people who are doing the same thing and those people can put you on i mean i think if you look at the history particularly the recent history of hollywood even outside of communities that have historically been excluded, you, have, you see teams moving through, posses of friends, right? And it's because when one person gets put on, they bring everybody else with them. And so you wanna find your people, right? Like who are the people who are doing the same things that you're doing, who see the world the same way that you do, have similar aesthetics to you. So when, when they go make their short, you're working on their short. When you're, ma when you're making a short, they're working on yours. They're giving you feedback on your work and vice versa. And then when doors open, they open not just for you, they open for everybody. And you can then deconstruct them when you're on the other side. I think there's, you know, there's a, a, a program just about for every stage, right? And so, you know, we're even looking at how do we get um, those students who are interested in engineering and in, interested into the sciences of film, right? There's so much technology that you utilize and so much engineering that you, so instead of taking that and applying that to the biotech world, let's apply that to film and let's see how you can come in and, and, and work in that space and visual effects or something to that that regard. So, you know, I think that you, you look at it in each phase and for those of us that have these seats where we can provide access or we can provide um, education or we can provide mentors in that space, then we look at how we can do so. So, okay, is it that we want to recruit those that may not have known and give them um, an introduction, if you will, to all the different careers that there are in film. To, because the, you're right, there's a lot of people that come from our communities that are women that probably never even thought about a career in film. I knew I grew up and I knew you could be a doctor or a lawyer and that was it. And then you're gonna make $100,000, you're gonna be rich. Like that's it, that, those were the two options, right? 
I tried to be a doctor, I didn't make it. So that being said, you know, how do you, you know, expose folks to what's possible? And so, you know, we're working a lot in in doing that as well. But I think to Franklin's point, there's a lot of people that are already very skilled that are already out there so that that has to be a different approach, right? And so, you know, as we look at what we're doing at the Academy, whether it's our Academy Next program, looking at those people who have a couple credits and might be three or four years out from, you know, being uh, eligible for membership for the Academy, since we're kind of on the tail end of things, or, you know, we wanna make sure that we separate them from our old internship program because they're not interns, they're not emerging, right? They're not all of those things that people uh, attribute to people who are just getting into the game. They've been in the game. They have been doing this work, right? And so now it is not only our responsibility to connect them with amazing Academy members to help um, make them feel welcome and know that there's a place for them here when they're ready, if they so choose, but it's also um, our responsibility to help broaden the lens through which excellence is recognized and, and that's our Aperture 2025 program. So that way we can also say, hey, there's a lot of talented people out there. They may not necessarily fit into your box of what you attribute to excellence, historically speaking. Um, and, and so we're working to break that down too. So I think, Trey, to your question, you know, when, when we are in these positions, we have to make sure that we um, figure out every single door that we can open, whether it's converting people, whether it's teaching people, whether it's providing access or whether it's blowing up every single construct that has been put in place before, you know, that's, that's on us and that that's our responsibility. And there's no one size fits all. And I think, you know, for folks that aren't in the industry, um, you know, a lot of times people walk out when a movie's over or they don't, you know, watch the end credits. I mean, that's yeah. one way to figure out, you know, where can I fit in? You might not know the definitions of what some of these positions are, um, but, you know, doing that research, you know, figuring it out. I mean, the entertainment industry at the end of the day is an industry. So any position that you see in any other industry is also in our industry. Uh, you know, we have accountants, we have, uh, you know, scenic painters, which is just a painter. Uh, we have landscapers, uh, you know, we have all these positions that are available that yes, our community is probably not aware of. Um, I came from real estate. I had a whole career in real estate and lending. Um, and, you know, now I've been in entertainment for, um, you know, over a decade. Um, and I think it is, it's really about kind of sitting in the dark sometimes and watching those in credits and seeing those come up, writing down, you know, some of those names that might not be familiar to you um, and Googling those. But I think also within the industry, you know, during this time of COVID, we've also, um, you know, realized that a lot of our communities don't know what's happening. And so you're going to probably see a lot more initiatives, a lot more things out there in the world that are going to open up for our community to let us to let folks know, you know, these are all the different jobs that, you know, are available to you, you know, on one crew on on one set, you have, you know, 300 plus different positions that are available that um, I know a majority of the folks don't know about but but are there. Yes. What measures do you think can be taken to ensure that these diversity initiatives and programs have both meaningful and scaling impact while also avoiding both tokenism and performative behavior? Because, you know, because we are in this pandemic now and a lot of people are, I guess, realizing things that have always happened, but all of a sudden now in 2020 and 2021, uh, there's more emphasis being put on there. So how do you think programs like this, um, not just the ones that you all are familiar with, but just like, I guess more of like those that are done by more mainstream entities uh, can do this without being tokenized and like kind of in a performative nature? Because I know that's something that's come up a lot, especially uh, on social media recently. I mean, Again, I think it really comes down to, is this a program or is this a job? Um, and, and it's one thing if it's, hey, we're going to, you know, make you spend a lot of this time doing a lot of this stuff. And so you can learn how to do this thing and we're not going to pay you for it. And maybe we'll hire you at some point down the road. Or is it we're hiring you? Right. Like here, here's what we know. There is no shortage of talent from historically underrepresented communities. In fact, there's a lot of it. And there are a lot of stories that haven't yet been told. So 
there are plenty of opportunities to hire great writers, great directors, great cinematographers, hire them, right? We don't, we don't need a program for you to hire them. And, and the best part about it is when you hire them on average and certainly better than the, the average that exists thus far, they will exceed your expectations and deliver excellent work, which will improve your bottom line. So, you know, this isn't me or, or us saying, hey, do us a favor and hire a bunch of diverse talent. It's do yourself a favor, hire a bunch of diverse talent so your movies and your television and your bottom line and your profit margins are better. Um, and that really is sort of the simplest thing. My father, who was in the army for 25 years, and it was sort of prone to these pithy, pithy aphorisms that I hated when I was a kid, he used to say, don't tell me your priorities, show me your budget. And I think that mm -hmm. is really the core of it. I don't need you to tell me how important diversity is to you show me how important diversity is to you by investing in it and don't invest in a program. If you believe that diversity is good for your bottom line, is good for your company, then you should do what you do with everything else that you believe is good for your bottom line and for your company. And that is to deploy financial resources and resources otherwise in that direction so that you can accomplish that business goal that will deliver you a better ROI and more profit. And if you're not doing that, it is performative and it's a waste of everybody's time not just the people that are going through the program, but also yours as a company. I completely agree. You have to operationalize it, right? It has to be in the core of what you do. It cannot be a program, period. And, um, you know, there has to be accountability. You, um, you know, it's the, that's why the Office of Representation reports into my office is because the people whom I'm holding accountable isn't the woman who leads the Office of Representation. It's the department heads, right? I'm holding our library uh, director responsible for making sure there's diverse collections in the library, right? And my lead, uh, the woman, Janelle English, who's phenomenal, who's leading the Office of Representation, Inclusion and Equity, she's there to help support. She's, help for best, she's there for best practices, right? She's there to continue the process, but it's him I am holding accountable, right? It's, and, and everybody is responsible, and, so, and he reports into me. So accountability is key, right? Goals are key, action plans are key. And, you know, and that was the conversation we had. Uh, obviously the Academy is, new to some of this and and we were real about that when we had this conversation you know and and when all of this happened this summer we said okay this cannot be performative it cannot be a black box it has to be an action plan and it has to be holistic right and so for us it was you know we had already begun with uh, diversifying our membership base and that was one and also adding seats to our board of governors which is also very key and critical you want to have people in leadership roles but we needed to actually all speak the same language, number one. We instituted mandatory and conscious bias training for our board, for our branch executive committees, for all of our staff and for senior leadership. Um, that wasn't enough, right? Then we also have to make sure that we have business plans that look at our the vendors, to your point about the money. Where are we spending our money, right? How are we, um, how are we supporting multicultural media? Are we um, buying ad space there? Are they getting space on the red carpet as well? Right. All of those things. Let's look at our investment committee. Is our, our portfolio, are we working with diverse managers? Right. All of these things that aren't as sexy and shiny as as awards and awards are just as important. Don't get me wrong, but it has to be a complete holistic approach as to who we are. We had to change who we are. And we also had to be comfortable with with standing strong in being a leader and just taking knowing that we go, we're going to get the negative. We're going to get the brunt of it anyway. So we might as well lead. And so how then does this trophy, this award, this organization influence our industry? We know it does. And thus, mm -hmm. let's put something in place, our inclusion standards that helps change and helps influence everyone around us, because again, we're at the end of the process, right? We're not the ones making the films. So how do we make sure that we help change the hearts and minds of those that are and, and stand strong within that as well? Um, and so those are all of the real conversations. And then also reconciliation, right? Making sure that we're acknowledging our history and, and being truthful about it and having real conversations about us, about the industry, about all of that, and making sure that we understand, have a true understanding 
of where we've come from, but also where we're going. And, and, and I'm really proud of our board and our leadership because they've doubled down on it. And, and they really have stood in the face of all the criticism that we've been getting, you know, and, and folks that consider it censorship as it relates to our inclusion standards and all of that fun stuff, you know, um, they've stood strong in it and, it and it takes that, but it's also because we have amazing board members like Ava uh, on our board and a number of other amazing folks on our board that help us stay strong in that. But, but all of those factors are key actions that we had to implement, that we had to operationalize so that we could continue this work and so that it wouldn't be just a black box. Yeah, and I think, you know, for the organizations like Blacklist and the Academy and Array where, you know, these things are built in our DNA is what we like to say. It's in our DNA. Um, you guys don't have programs to, to make sure you have enough people of color working uh, for Array? <laughs> we don't have those kind of programs because it's built in our DNA. <laughs> exactly. And we want to make sure that eventually, you know, in our industry is not even a conversation anymore. It's not a program yes. that, you know, let us shift our energy into, you know, working with those folks who are here that look like us, that represent us. Um, you know, that's five years from now, 10 years from now. That's what I think we all want to see, um, that inclusion programs aren't something that we have to continue to talk about or continue to try to create because we already have we look like that right everything looks like that and is re representative of what the real world looks like i think that's our our goal and we're better yeah, for it right we're all better for it and 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 to your earlier point franklin about the seasoning right the meal is going to be 10 times better there's gonna be that many more stories told uh if we continue this process yeah i mean look i, I think that uh, you know the need for diversity initiatives presumes that there's one kind of person doing the hiring. Um, and I think that the other thing, you know, if you want to make sure that diversity programs aren't necessary, that, that, that you've operationalized diversity, the best thing you can do as a leader at a company is replace yourself with someone who's diverse, because you can be almost certain that that diverse person, empowered in the way that you have been, um, they will hire people that look more like the world. And literally every corporate study inside the film industry and outside of it confirms this. Women who are directing movies hire more women as their crew. People of color who are directing movies hire more people of color and women as their crew. People, women who run major corporate organizations have more diverse corporate organizations and notably uh, have a higher return on their investment uh, typically, both uh, fund investments and corporate CEOs. So on some level, again, the best way that you can change your pipeline is to change your leadership. And that may mean self-replacing. Very good point. You know, not a popular like, answer, but it doesn't mean it's, it's not accurate. It's definitely not. But well, it, we're seeing it's, it more and more. People are stepping yeah. down and, and giving other people their platform, you know, whether it's board seats or whatever. And you're absolutely right. That is the best way to possibly do it. And and just the, and I'm sorry to mean interrupt you, Trey, but like Thank the you. sense of diversity and othered, right? Like why is we, the even the word diverse, in, it implies that there's others. Right. And, and that it's not inclusive as it is. So I like that we're all moving to inclusivity and representation and even more importantly, equity, because I think that's what we're all striving for. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. And I want to touch back on this pandemic <laughs> that we have been in for such a such a long time. And I'm not going to say it's kind of like flipped the industry, but in a sense it has, you know, things are really different. You if asked any of us about a year ago, <laughs> would we be in the similar position? You'd say, no way, absolutely not. You know, we're having Sundance now, um, virtual hybrid, and it's no telling when festivals are going to look the same. But I'd like to look forward and like how we are going to look after all of this. And I want to hear from you all some either positives or negatives uh, about the experience you think that creatives of color will have in the industry after the pandemic and um, this as this process we're making forward. Um, do you think that this is more so an opportunity um, for Black creatives to get more um, jobs, whether it's just opportunities in general, or do you think that it's going to be, you know, more of a rough transition? Um, to full on, you know, parity and equity and um, representation. What are your thoughts on that? 
I've answered first every time. I'm going to let y'all go. <laughs> <laughs> all the I, I answer the easy ones up front. Now y'all going to handle the hard stuff. <laughs> I, He's like, not this time. I don't think we have a crystal ball and we can't predict what's happening in the future. But I do think, you know, as an organization um, and as a community, we should be prepared. Um, you know, the pandemic has shown us that there can be more opportunity. I mean, just the reach for a film festival now is, is much wider. You know, when they're virtually online, it allows the world to be able to see um, mm. what's available, you know, through this festival or through this organization. So, um, you know, as an organization, I think it's just really essential for us to be prepared, you know, and creating, you know, these these things that we want to see happen within our industry. I mean, for Array, we're creating a uh, below the line database. You know, we're preparing for that. We're preparing for when sets are going to be back and hiring managers are going to start hiring because, you know, at some point there will be a deficit in the availability of television and film product. It just will be because people aren't shooting. Right. So at that point, you know, there are going to need to be qualified people on set and they're going to need to hurry up and, 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 you know, hire these folks. And so this is an opportunity. You know, if you are sitting stagnant at home, get ready, you know, take that course, take that online course, you know, make those connections, do what you need to do to be prepared because the industry will come back. And when it does, it is going to need to hire people that can do the work. Um, and so that is our opportunity to be ready, you know, for that, for that, when that comes. Yeah, I, I think it's also been this amazing opportunity. Um, and I think we touched on it earlier where you're getting tons more international inclusion, right? Because we don't have this barrier of physical presence that we have to be in. Um, I think we also have a bit of a democratization of what people get to watch, right? Because they're not being told what to watch. And um, as, and we're kind of seeing it with the Academy, like, and, and we're seeing where studios um, aren't necessarily putting out theirs yet. And thus we're not seeing the marketing campaigns around it, but we're, up, we're still seeing, we just had a, a call earlier where we were looking at all of our international films and there is such a plethora of beautiful international talent out there. So that, um, that misconception that, uh, that there isn't a ton of films to watch right now, production has stopped now, but there, there was a lot that was kind of in the can that's out in there now to watch. And it's, it's beautiful. It's really beautiful. So my point is that I think that we're kind of, we've almost made a little bit of a step towards equity because of this democratization and because of technology. Um, and I think we got to hold on to that as much as humanly possible when we come out of this so that when we are on the other side, and, and I agree, we will be on the other side of it, um, that that stays the same. There is a lot of inequities that were institutionalized that we had to overcome. COVID kind of wiped that out. It put everybody mm -hmm. on the same plane for a minute there. And so now, you know, you can take that phone and you can shoot that movie and you could kind of market it yourself. And, um, and there's a lot more ways to get that out to folks than there was before. There's a lot more options now than there were before. Of course, we all want to go back in theatrically and, and view it. But for right now, there's a lot of options for people to be able to get these beautiful stories out there. And I think we need to hold on to that um, because we have leapfrogged some of the inequities that were there and we have to be very diligent not to go backwards. Yeah, I think the one thing that I'm particularly cognizant of is that if you look at history, particularly the last three decades of Hollywood history, when there have been major economic shocks to the industry, because of market changes, because of technological changes, the first people to lose are black folks um, and, and folks uh, who are members of historically underrepresented communities. And you can look at the numbers of representation. There will be periods where the numbers just dip in terms of feature film directors, television uh, showrunners, et cetera. And you'll go back and be like, oh, right, that was the uh, subprime mortgage crash. Oh, right, this was the shift uh, where China became a more important part of the mix of uh, movies that the studios put out. So I think we need to be very cognizant that when um, the industry gets conservative because their perception of risk increases, the, the tendency is to say, okay, well, we need to default to what has always worked and what has always worked is that which is not historically underrepresented. So I think a lot of opportunities exist. Like Tulane said, we, none of us have a crystal ball. 
if we did, we certainly probably could have made some really good investments a year ago that would have made, made us never have to work again uh, because of the pandemic. But, um, but I think we need to be very cognizant of, of where those uh, traps are and make sure that not only are we, we, that we get ready, that we stay ready, but also that we call people out when we see them doing the things that historically have made it even harder for us during these periods where it's hard for everybody. Yeah, yeah. And I wanted to bring up just how, you know, press access kind of goes in hand with all those points you all mentioned, too, and mm -hmm. about how with Sundance, you know, I've, of course, had the um, privilege of, you know, covering in Park City for several years, but there's just been so many people I've seen on social media that are like, oh, I finally get to, you know, cover Sundance this year. People are like, oh, I got tickets for Judas and the Black Messiah. I can see it um, before it comes in theaters. And I think that, you know, COVID kind of you like leveled the playing field a little bit, allowing us to think of different ways for inclusion. You know, a lot of people who may not be able to go to the park seat before it now can, you know, cover just like they like, you know, they did TIFF and the other festivals and stuff. And I think that it's important to like take some learnings of things and realizations that have happened during the pandemic and figuring out figuring how that can be scaled and applied as soon as we get back to normal, which I've all I keep saying is a new normal because I don't think we're going back to the normal that we did know about, but it's going to be whatever, honestly, you know, this may sound kind of cheesy, but like what we want it to be, like, you know, what what's the ideal look and feel that we think this needs to look like after all this is said and done, because we pretty much are, you know, starting from scratch, leveling it out, like things are not the same and it allows a lot of room for, for opportunity, I feel, I feel. Okay. I mean, I, I want to give a shout out to Sundance, actually, for, for supporting uh, sort of historically underrepresented journalists to be able to attend the festival, not just this year, in the two years prior, right? They, they've made real substantive financial investments to make sure that I think it was 100 critics uh, two years ago, and I think they may have even expanded it more, I don't have my numbers perfect, uh, last year, um, to diversify the mix of film journalists and film writers that were on the mountain writing about the festival. This may be an unpopular opinion, but I don't think that everybody needs to be at Sundance writing about films that are there. And that's like that's not the, 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 the solution. The solution is not that everybody who wants to write about movies gets to go to Sundance free of charge to write about movies early. Some people will have to see these films later, right? My solution is that the best writers should be at Sundance writing about the festival. And that means that some of the people who've been there for the last 20 years and may not be from historically <laughs> underrepresented communities don't need to be there because they're not adding to the conversation and they can be replaced by some of the people who've historically been excluded, right? Because again, the solution is not always everybody gets the opportunity. The solution is Ideally, in a marketplace, the people who have shown up and shown out and have earned the opportunity and will continue to deliver great work, those people have the opportunity. And again, if we have a true meritocracy, we will see more diversity than we've seen historically because gender has nothing to do with being able to write well about film. Race has nothing to do with being able to write well about film. These are not tied to any identity issue. The access is tied to those things. So let's let's aspire towards a world where the people who are putting in the work who are doing good work have the opportunity to make things based on the work that they are putting in not based on their proximity to whiteness to maleness to straightness to able-bodiedness and all of those things which is historically how it has always worked. I've long said that the only affirmative action that exists in Hollywood is in favor of white straight able-bodied men no one who's a black woman is getting put on because they're a black woman. They're getting put on because they did a ton of work. And then someone said, look, you, you've really gone through it. We're going to give you the opportunity that you probably deserved several years ago. And then you're going to show up and show out. Right. And, and I think that's the shift that we need to make, not further expanding the pie, but making sure that the pie has the best ingredients on it. And, you know, honestly, and I'm glad you brought that because that's kind of also tied to like the reception of films as well. Cause you know, it's it's not a mutually exclusive thing. Like race doesn't matter, gender doesn't matter when you're talking about who are the people that are talking about these films. But then in a sense it also does because you want to make sure that oh, it's diverse enough 
to talk about these films. I could, there's countless times, not just at Sundance, but other festivals where, um, well, I'll just use Sundance, for example, because Sundance had a, a very black year <laughs> last year, for lack of a better term. And then the, the problem comes in when you have, you know, the same people writing about all the films there. And then you're like, well, if this had a different lens on it, then the conversation could be totally different <laughs> than what it well, is now. Because a lot of those film critics don't have the range. I mean, just put a very fine point on it. If you're writing about Zola, let's take Sundance as an example oh, last year. Yeah, if, yeah, you're, yeah. if you're a white critic and you're tweeting about it being ghetto-tastic, you, like, you shouldn't be writing about Zola if you don't understand what baby hairs mean and what they are, because the opening shot of the film is about baby hair and a black woman and a white woman's relationship to baby hair. Now, if you, don't, if you can't unpack that image, you probably aren't qualified to be a film critic about that film, right? And so, and, and here's the other thing, I would say a lot of diverse critics have greater range in this sense because we've been forced to consume the culture of the dominant cult. We've been forced to consume the dominant culture and we are participants in our own cultures and oftentimes cultures adjacent to it, right? So I am perfectly capable of, you know, watching a Noah Baumbach film and understanding all of the references and appreciating it for what it is. I am also perfectly capable of watching Janitz's film and Jeremy O. Harris's work and understanding what they're trying to do, right? My white peers may not be able to do the same thing. And so it is critically important that the critical establishment looks like the world. And right now it doesn't. I think the numbers that Stacey Smith came out of USC with is that there are 33 white male critics for every female critic of color. Wow. That is mind boggling. And it is no wonder when there is a movie about women of color that comes out, it is undervalued by the critical establishment, which as a consequence means that it's undervalued by the financial establishment that is deciding whether to acquire and distribute those films, unless you're lucky enough to be distributed by array. And, um, and the consequences are, you know, cycle through multiple cycles of, a, of someone's career. That movie wasn't as successful. They get lower budgets for their next movie. That movie isn't appreciated as much. They get lower budgets for their next movie. That's not a reflection of their talent. That's a reflection of the lack of talent by the people who are appraising the value of their work. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I agree. And I think it also, it, it takes you to all those different tangential right areas where you have to look at diversity so if you even take our nickel screenwriting program right we wanted to make sure that you know not only are the judges diverse but then in the first round of that we actually hire readers to read the scripts well we found that it was not diverse enough and and we we worked backwards we noticed that most of our scripts that were finalized earlier a couple years back weren't uh diverse enough so as we looked at every stop along the way so then we created that diverse reader program so not only now are we going to see more diverse scripts and people qualified to be able to understand those stories that are being told from all different backgrounds and 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 areas geographically as well as experiences. Uh, but we're also creating new jobs, right? Because those folks are also going other places and reading scripts. And then they're getting that perspective and that experience that then qualifies them in these different realms. And so to you know, all of our point, like all of these different areas, have, we have to look at the diversity in all of them because they all literally can make or break something and then you'll get to noms we'll get to noms again and it's not there for whatever the reason maybe it got a bad review right maybe the script wasn't read by someone diverse who didn't get it all of those different reasons why things don't manifest as we want to see them so it's our responsibility to look at every single cog in the wheel yeah i'm glad you brought up that point because it kind of a good segue to my next question what is something in the internal behind the scenes process as you know producers you know people behind the scenes about bringing a project to life what do you think is the biggest misconception there like you know you know as a film journalist like i i study all the trades like i'm always into the trades i know what a project looks like from the beginning of its life cycle to serious cancellation or you know debut in theaters whatever that may be and a lot of times people don't really understand the ins and outs of a lot of this stuff. And it, it reminds me of a conversation that happened again on social media recently about a, a film coming out. Um, the actress, you know, financed the film herself and is starring in it. But 
when the trailer dropped, everyone's like, oh, this needs to be recast. And a lot of people just don't know what all goes into behind the scenes of projects, where the money comes, well, first of all, where the money comes from. Second of all, how things are even acquired, because something that's a Netflix film, it may not be, it may be a Netflix original film, but it may not be produced by Netflix. Netflix may have just wanted to buy this film like they buy films at festivals. But in a general, broader sense, what are some things that you think would be helpful for people to know that goes into that behind the scenes uh, creative process that you get, you all have experience with in your day to day? I mean, I think the biggest lesson that I've learned is that you don't have to wait for a studio to green light you. Um, I think a lot of people will write a script or create, come up with a concept or, um, you know, have every, all the ducks in the row and that's what they're waiting for. And you don't have to wait for that, especially now. Um, you know, there was a time 10 years ago where, yeah, you probably would have to wait. But now with, you know, iPhone capabilities, um, with so many streaming companies out there in the world, um, so many different platforms, TikTok, you know, Instagram, you know, all these different things, YouTube. Um, I think, you know, waiting for someone to tell you that you can do that project or do that work is the biggest mistake you can make. Um, you know, if you have the capability and you're willing to take a chance on yourself, I say do it. Because if you're waiting for someone to tell you, yes, you can do it. If you're waiting for a festival to tell you, yes, you can do it. Um, you might not ever get that yes. Yeah, the other thing I would add is that at the end of the day, this is a business, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that it's very easy to say, oh, why didn't they do it this way? Why aren't they making more movies like that? Um, but at the end of the day, you know, what happens in Hollywood is that, that somebody makes a decision to invest millions or let's say hundreds of thousands on the low end, millions to tens of millions to hundreds of millions of dollars on the high end into telling a story. And to make that decision, they have to have a reasonable belief that they will get that money back plus some percentage preferably more than they would have gotten by investing in some sort of conservative mutual fund, right? Like that's the goal. And so whoever is making that decision, you have to give them a reason to believe that that's the case. Otherwise it's a waste of money, right? Because think about all the other things you could be doing with that money, especially during COVID, right? You could be providing for people that, that have lost their homes. You could be feeding people. You could be investing in vaccine research, but instead you're making a movie. And that movie needs to either be amazing art that is going to sort of change the culture or it needs to deliver a financial return for the people who invested in it. And if you don't have a theory of the case behind that, odds are you're not going to get your movie made and you can't really snipe at somebody who fails to get their movie made if they can't make that case. And the other thing is, is that most filmmakers aren't trying to tell only one story. So let's say you decide, you, you manage to trick somebody into giving you that money, even though you have no plan on getting that money back. Good luck making the second movie when your first movie doesn't do well, because they're going to look back at that first movie and say, well, you convinced this person to give you $10 million and you came back and gave them two and you're asking me for 20. I'm not trying to lose $16 million, right? Convince me that I will see this money again. And that's unfortunate, but it is a reality of the way in which a capitalist sort of culture making business works. And it's a resource intensive business. If you want to tell a story and you don't think you can make that, you can make that money back, start with a screenplay, start with a novel, it'll cost you $10 for paper and pen, right? You can distribute it on the internet virtually for free. We have to recognize that this is a business and that people function within it as a business. And you ideally are trying to contribute to the culture, make great art on top of this. But if you can't make the business case, you are probably not gonna get the money necessary to make the artistic and cultural case either. Yeah. And as we begin to wrap up this conversation, um, I want to ask, what's one thing that you would like to see in this new landscape that we're heading in that you have not seen so far in your journey in the industry? Ooh. Where do I start? <laughs> Just one. Where's my list? <laughs> I mean, I, I can go. I can go up for hours about this. I mean, look an industry that looks like that looks like the world just straight up the leadership of hollywood right now is less diverse than donald trust cabinet was just on the numbers that's a fact right 
Elaine Chow, Betsy DeVos, Ben Carson. Within the context of the cabinet, I think the small business administrator, within the context of the cabinet, Trump's cabinet was more diverse than the senior leadership of Hollywood. That's a fact. And it's certainly less diverse than Biden's. Now, you're going to tell me that the country can be run by people that diverse, but the people telling the, the, the country's stories can't be? There's a fundamental disconnect there. And, and by the way, it perpetuates the things that we saw in Washington 10 on January 6th. It perpetuates how we ended up in the Trump administration in the first place. It's why people were chanting, build the wall. It's why Me Too exists. And, th and that is just a simple fact of the stories we tell about who we are as a people and what our potentials are as individuals. And that goes back to Birth of a Nation, the first ever Hollywood blockbuster. Yeah, I agree with Franklin, um, you know, just seeing more, seeing more of us, um, you know, in positions to be able to say yes, to be able to give that opportunity. Um, and, you know, we all have allies that don't look like us and, and that's wonderful, but um, we definitely need more um, leadership that's out there to be able to say um, your story matters and, and we're going to put the funding behind it to make sure that um, the world sees it. Um, uh, building on that, right? So I think it's the uh, the power and freedom that comes with equity and how all those things dance around each other, right? So the more power that we have, and I don't mean money hungry, grab territorial power. I mean, true equity where we can make those decisions, where we are the ones that can decide whether it is a period piece that's all non-diverse or all monolithic that we want to make, or it's the most beautiful black story you'll ever make in life, but that we have the power and the liberty to be able to do that, the freedom to be able to make those decisions and it be seen as excellent by all cultures, not just the dominant one that we've been taught for so long. That's what excellence is. So I think that's, you know, that's equity, that's freedom. Um, and a lot of that comes with power, but the good power, the one that uses its power for good and not evil, you know, like in the movies. <laughs> full circle, full circle. Full circle. And yes, I am that corny. <laughs> and with that, we will conclude this panel and great conversation. Thank you to our wonderful panelists. And thanks to everyone who's watching. Please stay up to date with all the other happenings at the Macro Lodge at Sundance, and thanks for joining us.